Good morning. As we continue looking at the songs we sing, we like to take an opportunity this morning to look at the song, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Now, in our song books, we only have three verses, uh, but as I was preparing this, I looked and I found that there's actually a fourth verse, so we are going to look at all four stanzas of this particular song. It's appropriate at a time in which the world is focused on Jesus, whether they are actively arguing against the Christ or whether they are saying, hey, let's celebrate his birth, it is appropriate that we take the opportunity, that we consider the reality that there is a story to tell about Jesus, that there is an individual who lived his life, who came to this earth, who died for us, and who now sits at the right hand of God, ready to, or ready to intercede on our behalf. We live in a time in which we are truly blessed to have so many opportunities to tell the story of Jesus. But to actively ignore one opportunity would be a waste and it would be sinful. The song this morning, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. You know, we understand that the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, 11 and 15, we'll look at verse 15. He said, your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I wonder if perhaps this is the verse our songwriter was thinking of when he said, tell me the story of Jesus, write in my heart every word. Do we know, do we fully, truly know the life of Christ, what he did for us, how he came upon this world, the reality that at his birth, angels, according to Luke chapter 2, angels sang glory to God. Then the angel said to him, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, who, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. The story of our Savior begins with his birth. It begins with the reality that Mary and Joseph were told, hey, you are going to have a son. That which is in you is of the Holy Spirit. It was told that shepherds, as they were out tending to their sheep, were given a message. There's a Savior born to you. And then we see that the angels, upon announcing that reality, announcing that the Christ had entered the world, that he had been born, they sing praises to God. Joyful, rejoicing at what the birth of Christ would mean. Tell me the story of Jesus. The second stanza says, Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. As we fast forward, we have a little bit about the life of Jesus. We understand that at eight years old, he goes to Jerusalem. He sp speaks in the temple. He astounds everyone. They're shocked at the knowledge, the thirst for knowledge this young boy has. He gets separated from his parents. He stays, and Mary and Joseph, they're worried sick about him. But he says... Do you not know that I ought to be about my father's business? That young boy grows up into a man who enters into his ministry, enters into the work in which God had, the business of his father. And the first thing we see is that he is tempted. 
He is tried. He is alone. In Matthew 4, verses 1 and then verse 11, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There he would fast for 40 days and nights. He would face Satan. Satan would tell him, yeah, he turned this bread into, turn the stone into bread. He would tell him, jump off. The angels will take care of you. Jump off the temple. He would tell him, look, everything you see, I'm going to give it to you. And Jesus would answer and say, go away. He was tempted, but he was triumphant. As our song says, he was triumphant at last. And we see in verse 11, then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. You know, the sad reality is that though he left him, another account tells us he left him but for a season. And perhaps that is why when Jesus is calling disciples, telling them, come, join me, that he has to say in Matthew 8, verse 20, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was rejected. His own homeland, his own hometown rather, kicked him out. His family rejected him on occasion. His disciples would abandon him. Multitudes that followed him hungry, desiring for him to teach, desiring for him to take care of them, they would abandon him. Yes, he faced the temptation of the devil and he was triumphant, but he still faced sorrow. He still faced physical hardships. And we know with certainty that Satan wasn't done with him. That's the story of our Lord. The babe who was born to the singing of angels. The child who would say, I have to be about my father's business. The man who would face off with Satan and rise triumphant. But who suffered greatly as he lived his life. Tell me the story. See, as we continue studying, we see the third stanza says, Tell me of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love, pay the ransom for me. <laughs> Jesus would go about his ministry three, roughly three years. He would face temptation. He would face physical trials. He would face hardships. And he would bring about the hatred of the Jewish people. His people. In their anger, they would betray him, bring him before the Roman authorities, they would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And we're told that that's exactly what would happen. In John chapter 19, in verses 17 through 18, we read, And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is also called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Fulfilling prophecy, even in his death, he was hung among malefactors. He was hung in the middle of two who were sinful, who deserved their fate. Even in death, he accomplished the will of God. Even in his sufferings, he feathered the will of his father, as he said again, all those years ago. At eight years old, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? He would hang on that cross, our Savior, and he would die. He would utter words such as, forgive them for they know not what they do. Behold your mother, behold your son. It is finished. And then he would be buried. In John 19, 38 through 42, we read of the burial of Christ. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, 
asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of mirth and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was not there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. You know, there are people who argue, oh, well, he wasn't really dead. He just passed out. That's how he was able to get up out of that cave and, and walk off. But listen to what this says. Think about the ridiculousness of saying a man who had been crucified, a man who had nails shoved through his wrists, through his feet, is able to stand up, walk, after being wrapped in strips of linen coated in spices and oils. Coated in such a way that he would have been suffocated if he'd actually been alive. Explain to me how a man in such a state would be able to shove the stone placed in front of the tomb out of the way. Explain how he would have the wherewithal to neatly wrap the bandages that covered him and placed them in the tomb. There can be no doubt that our Lord died. He was buried. He was buried, and yet we're told with certainty that he is risen. Tell how he's gone back to heaven, up to the right hand of God, how he is there interceding while on the earth we must try. Tell of the sweet Holy Spirit he has poured out from above. Tell how he's coming in glory for all the saints of his love. Jesus now sits at the right hand of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul asks the question, Who is it? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, he says. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercessions for us. Our advocate, our mediator, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, the Word, He who has become man and yet is God, now sits at the right hand of God. And while, yes, He can absolutely judge us, He has lived where we have lived, He has seen what we have seen, He has done what He has done. You know, I read a Facebook post where someone asked, I wonder if Jesus ever looked up at the stars that He created with wonder as a man. Makes you think, doesn't it? What must it have been like for Jesus to live as a man, to look up at his creation and say, wow, I sure did create something beautiful. He endured, he lived, and then he died for us. And he now sits at the right hand of God and he will tell his father, I endured through that, they can too. They did a good job. They suffered, but they've overcome. Or he's going to tell them, look, they fell. They could have overcome. They had the tools needed. I went through that. Jesus is the judge, the righteous judge. He's interceding on us, but the, the flip side of that is he's also going to judge us when we fell. And he's coming again. <laughs> You see, in Acts chapter 2, we're told of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 2, we read, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of fire. The one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. That Holy Spirit would then tell the apostles, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to say. It would guide them in all things, as Jesus promised. 
he would get up along with the other the other the eleven. He would get up and he would proclaim that first gospel sermon in Acts chapter two. It would spread. We would go from Jerusalem through all of Judea to Samaria and then to the Gentile population. And the word of the Holy Spirit, the word of Christ, that which Jesus commanded to be taught, will be proclaimed to all people as we now study it this morning. We now have the opportunity to say, tell me the story of Jesus. The course of our song, tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. There are a plethora of emotions that come about as one takes the opportunity to study the, the story of Jesus. And obviously this morning we have only scratched the surface. We haven't taken the opportunity to look at Jesus' true birth. How we're told of the account of the angel coming to Mary. Joseph's fear, his worries. We, we haven't studied the actual birth of John the Immerser, how Jesus, and as he was in the womb, would go and meet John before he was born, how that babe would leap in the womb. We haven't told of the earthly ministry of Jesus, the parables, the miracles. The story of Jesus is so much more than what we've been able to cover this morning. But as we consider the story of Jesus, we smile, we laugh, we rejoice, we cry, we weep. We break down with bitter anguish. Because we understand that the story of Jesus teaches us that he came and he died and we have hope for life. But the story of Jesus teaches us he came and he died because of us because of the bitter reality of who we are. Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect child, the perfect man, he died. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me of his birth. Tell me of his life. Tell me of his death. But tell me where he is now. Tell me what he would have me to do now. This morning, as so many people in the world are contemplating, they are thinking, they are focused on Jesus, we have an obligation to tell them, to remind them that there's more than the birth. The birth that angels sung upon. The birth that we know with certainty God and Jesus were rejoicing over for it brought about the establishment of the church. It was that final piece that led to victory over death, victory over sin, victory over Satan. But we have an obligation to remind them that that baby grew up and he died so that we might have life. This morning, if you were here, will you not answer the gospel's call? Will you not answer the story of Jesus? If you believe that he is the Christ, if you believe that that baby grew up to live his life as the son of God, to die as the son of man, and he now sits upon the right hand of God, will you not do what is necessary to be faithful in his sight? True belief requires action, I can't just believe something. Oh, okay, I believe that, but do nothing about it. If I truly and genuinely believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I must act upon that belief or face the dire consequences of the neglect. This morning, if you believe that He is the Christ, will you not repent of the life you've once lived? Change who you are to be like who he would have you to be. Make that great confession that he is the Christ. 
and then be baptized in the watery grave of baptism. Come into contact with the blood that he shed on that cross. Wash away your sins so that you can rise a new creature just as he did. This morning, if you were here and you need to do these things, then we encourage you to come forward. <coughs> but if somewhere along the way you've realized you've struggled, you stumbled off the course, understand that we have to be faithful. We have to continue on. We have to keep walking. What we choose to do, the path that we choose to follow, is not something that we can take one step and then stop. We have to keep walking. Jesus walked all the way to the cross. How much more should we walk for him? If you were here this morning, you need any prayers in the congregation. If we can help you in any way, now is the time as we stand and as we say. <coughs> Thy name is filled with transition.